Hi, Jeffrey Miller. Diana Fleischman. What are you doing here? <laughs> I'm here to interview you about virtue signaling. It's an honor to be interviewed by my fiance about my new book. Jeffrey Miller, what, what? why are you writing a book about virtue signaling? I think it's important. Um, virtue signaling is this phrase that gets tossed around a lot on social media and political discussions. And I think a lot of people, you know, use it as a term of, of derogation against their political enemies. Like, you're just virtue signaling. But I think there's a lot more to it. I think there's a deeper backstory to virtue signaling in terms of human evolution and the social and sexual functions of virtue signaling. And I think it's just a really crucial but misunderstood part of human uh, political and religious life and of culture in general. Cool. So uh, just to kind of get us started, not everybody know. I mean, people see other people derogate people with virtue signaling, although you would never derogate anybody by saying they were virtue signaling. I do. I have, I have been known to do that on Twitter. No. Even, even <laughs> I sometimes use it to, to mean you're, you're just virtue signaling. It's cheap talk. It's hypocrisy. Yeah. So we'll get into the difference in that in a second. But uh, first of all, you know, talk about like what is signaling. Obviously, that's a huge topic. But what is signaling? Signaling is just whenever any organism or group or company or nation sends any signals to somebody else or some other group to show off some kind of traits, right? So a prey animal being chased by a predator might show off, I'm really fast, I'm capable, I'm healthy, I'm not even worth chasing, right? Or an animal that's trying to attract a mate might send courtship signals or sexual ornaments to uh, impress the potential mate and say, I'm healthy, I'm fit, I have good genes, I'm worth mating with. And then it goes all the way up to nation states might signal, if you do that, you know, that's bad, we'll mess you up in some way. And so that could include everything from military parades to economic sanctions. So signaling happens at many, many levels, all the way from the simplest bugs to geopolitics. Yeah. So I read one of your essays in the book, which was about uh, the handicap principle, and it was sort of alluding to the idea about whether or not signaling is necessarily always honest, right? And so the difference between costly signaling and signaling that is somewhat you know, less costly. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, talk about you know, even the handicap principle. So economists have this concept called cheap talk. And cheap talk is when you're sending a signal, but there's nothing to back it up. Right, you're just making a claim that I have some particular trait or motive or intention. And the other person kind of has to take it on trust. Right? There's no necessary correlation between the signal and the underlying trait that's being signaled. On the other extreme, there's reliable hard to fake signals. Like for example, if you win an Olympic medal in some sport, that's a really hard to fake signal of athleticism mm. and skill. Yeah. You know? So, so if I'm talking about whether or not a signal is necessarily honest, a signal that is costly is much more likely to be honest than a signal that isn't costly. Yeah. So what's an example of a costly signal or a not costly signal? So one costly signal is literally on your finger, which is the engagement ring I gave you. But you designed um, it. So yesterday. You, you didn't even just, just pay so for it. Yeah. There's the, the, the monetary cost, but there's also the weeks and weeks of design cost, right? And what that is, is a commitment signal, as we call it in um, human sexuality. So it's a hard to fake signal in the sense that I couldn't have afforded the time and money and energy to give a ring like that to like a dozen women. You couldn't? Like it's just, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe someday, if the book does well. <laughs> so it's hard to fake in the sense that yeah. it's got opportunity costs oh. and direct costs. Um, and also there's a social signal element to it that is, um, if a bunch of women were all running around with Jeffrey Miller engagement rings, then I would be called out on that. And there'd be social punishment and ostracism. And Okay, so we've gone over signaling in general, and there's obviously a lot of signaling that happens both in organisms and among human organisms. But what is in particular virtue signaling? And you also talk about two different kinds of virtue signaling in the book. Virtue signaling in general is just signaling your, your virtues, like your morally relevant traits, traits that might predict how reliable and ethical will you be when you interact with people. So those virtues might include things like honesty, 
and fidelity and having a uh, concern about getting your facts straight and being a reliable friend or ally. So any virtue that a moral philosopher would consider a virtue, you know, you can signal and all of that would be virtue signaling. Mm. Now, of course, in the public realm, it's often taken to mean you're signaling certain political attitudes and beliefs or certain religious commitments. So if you're a church going person, then the act of going to church regularly is itself a virtue signal because everybody else can see your church attendance pattern or your tithing or your donations to the church. And in the political realm, the virtue signaling could range all the way from just having a bumper sticker, which costs $2 and has very few other costs, up to, you know, volunteering for months on a political campaign in a way that's very, very hard to fake. Like a Democrat would just not bother, you know, volunteering for a Republican campaign or vice versa. So it covers a, a huge variety of stuff, but the heart of the idea is you're showing off something about yourself that's that's morally relevant. Yeah. And also you talk a little bit about the sort of effectiveness of the signal as opposed to the loudness of the signal, right? So if you tie the church or if you go to church, that's actually not a very loud signal, but it's a very honest signal, right? Whereas there's other signals that are louder, like tweeting uh, or, you know, joining a, a pile on on Twitter, uh, condemning mm -hmm. some academic, for example, yeah. and uh, versus actually doing something about the whatever issue that you're actually concerned about. Yeah, so there's all kinds of variants in virtue signaling. It can, it can be very, very public where you're, you're broadcasting your values, your, your ideological, political, religious commitments to many, many people. That can happen on social media or broadcast news or whatever. And some of those signals are reliable. Some of them are cheap talk. Just because it's on social media doesn't necessarily mean it's cheap talk because it can be quite dangerous to express certain views. And then you can have extremely private signals just within couples or within families that can also be very reliable virtue signals and that nobody else necessarily hears about, mm. you know, outside a bedroom or outside a house. So just because it's a virtue signal doesn't necessarily mean it's public. Okay. Can you, oh, I could give you an example, actually. I just thought of one. I knew this woman and her husband every mm. night would turn on an electric blanket in the bed so that an hour before she got to bed. And that took, obviously, some memory and some consideration. And that was mm. a signal to her of his virtue of, of commitment. Yeah, so that's romantic proof. And that's, um, it's hard to fake because it's hard for a lot of guys to remember to do that yeah. regularly. So how does, how does virtue signaling relate to the other kinds of signaling that people do? Well, it, it, I think it is useful to highlight that there's a lot of signaling going on besides virtue signaling. So you can do general fitness signaling, which is when any animal shows off its, its good health, its energy level, its competence to any other animal. And that could be non-human, it could be within human groups or families. There can be intelligence signaling, where you're showing off you're smart and you know things. And that's what a lot of people spend time doing in academia, yeah. right? Intelligence signaling. And then there's signaling particular personality traits, like I'm extroverted, look at me, woohoo, I'm at a party. Um, or signaling openness, right? We watch Ink Master a lot, the, the reality TV show about tattoos. Yeah. And I think tattoos are often reliable signals of um, openness. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So... All kinds of signaling, virtue signaling is just a part of it. And where did the idea of virtual, uh, virtue signaling actually come from? Like who coined the term? Where did, where did it? Because you, you give a couple mm -hmm. of different sources in the book as to where it might have come from. I think all the way back to Aristotle where he talked about virtue ethics mm -hmm. and the idea that the heart of morality is the stable virtues that people cultivate in terms of how they interact with other people and, and with the broader society. I think Aristotle himself knew people show off those virtues, and that's okay, right? He, he saw virtue signaling as, I think, a positive thing. And then you get into the, the sort of modern discussion about it. I think the actual phrase of virtue signaling per se, I didn't invent it. I thought about it, but I didn't invent the signal, yeah. the, the, the phrase which I had. 
I think it goes back to about 2013 with the rationalist blog called Less Wrong. Yep. I'm not sure exactly who coined the term, but the rationalist community and the effective altruist community have been using the term at least for the last you know, five or seven years. But the concept, um, you think, has been around? I think the concept has been around for much longer. Ever since people understood that like, some people are hypocrites and some people show off. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure that in the, in the Middle Ages, when wealthy donors were giving money to build cathedrals and demanding that, okay, the cathedral should include my name or I should be represented in the stained glass, that everybody around them knew that was a kind of virtue signaling, yeah. even if they didn't have words for it. Um, so how did you get interested in virtue signaling in particular? The first essay in the book called Political Peacocks actually has the kind of origin story of my interest in this stuff. And it goes back to college where I saw some sustained political protests against apartheid at Columbia University in the 80s. And I was just fascinated that these protests all had a certain structure that made them, you know, partly effective as protests to achieve the stated aim of trying to get the university to divest from companies that do business in South Africa, right, so that you could undermine apartheid economically. Mm. But also the protests had this structure of great place to meet friends, to meet like-minded people, and to meet potential mates. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people actually found boyfriends and girlfriends at the protests. So I thought, hmm, there's something interesting about kind of public political activity where you're showing off, I care so much about people far away I've never met. And you can take like a cynical view of that, that you're only doing it to make friends and and meet potential mates. Or you can take a more neutral view and go, In a way, that's kind of cool because it does motivate political action and passions and changing things, Um, sometimes in the service of the greater good, sometimes in totally counterproductive, stupid ways. Yeah. But the the psychology of it was what what really gripped me. I think that having a cynical view isn't necessarily to say that there is nothing moral about human beings, right? Obviously, people do things when it's easier to do things, and that's one central idea in you know effective animal advocacy that when it's easier to not eat meat or when it's cheaper to eat cellular or <coughs> clean meat then that's when people are going to be much more moral because it's easy easier to do and because there's some incentive for them to do it yeah. so what do the left and right differentially virtue signal about who do you think that one you know versus the left or the right i mean they're hard to Defined mm-hmm. directly, but do you think that one virtue signals more than the other? Well, as a libertarian centrist, of course, <laughs> I think both sides virtue signal a lot, but so do I. Everybody virtue signals much more than they realize all the time. That's one of the key themes in the book is this is not just something that the other side does, this is something everybody does. So I think typically what you see is, and, and Jonathan Haidt has talked about this a lot in his book, The Righteous Mind, the left tends to care a lot about reducing harm to people and about fairness, right? So kindness and fairness. A lot of what the left cares about boils down to ways of showing I have empathy for others who are not directly allied with me in other countries, in other genders, in other social classes. Well, even things like the environment is a way of signaling your allegiance with wild animals or yeah. with an abstract concept or an abstract beauty of the environment as such, right? Yeah, I care about the polar bears and the harp seals and and, yeah. all, and future generations, blah, blah, blah. And I think the right also cares about those things, but they also care about other things like loyalty and patriotism and traditionalism and respect for hierarchy and kind of moral purity. So I think often on the right, you get a kind of overlap between religious virtue signaling and political virtue signaling in a way that, you know, the left tends to be more atheist or pagan or or they worship the state rather than <laughs> God. Jeffrey. Well, they kind of do, let's be honest. Like, state, give me things, forgive. 
please forgive my college. You are you are really working hard to undo the stereotype that you have on Twitter. <laughs> Good. Um, point is, oh, and then conservative. Well, everybody claims they care about freedom, but different kinds of freedom. Absolutely, yeah. Right, freedom to own guns versus freedom to have polyamorous relationships. Yeah. For example, I love both, but. Uh, so I think the mistake is for people on the right to say, oh, only the people on the left virtue signal, you know, or yeah. vice versa. I think it, it's it's just a human instinct, and it just plays out in different ways. I don't I don't know. I, I think that the right is more often accusing the left of doing virtue signaling, and I certainly think that the kind of left has called out the right for saying, you know. You're you're in my prayers. Like that's mm-hmm. a form of che- of cheap talk, mm-hmm. but you can actually pray in quite a costly way as well. Yeah. So I think that the rights often been very offended by that idea that hopes and prayers or prayers are, haven't you know don't have anything to do with anything or don't actually have an influence. So virtue signaling is it really net good or net bad? Do you think it's the best thing about human nature? So you could obviously think from reading this or from looking at your tweets that you are very cynical and critical about virtue signaling, but you obviously present both sides in this book. I think it's the best of human nature and it's it's also the worst of human nature. So on the one hand, historically, you know, in our political life, the last 500 years, almost every major ethical revolution has been driven by good virtue signaling. So the abolitionist movement against slavery, the anti-vivisection movement in Victorian England, that's like, we shouldn't cut apart live animals just to study them. We should euthanize them first. The women's suffrage movement to get the vote, the um, civil rights movement in the 1960s, the gay rights movement in the 70s, all of these took this instinct for virtue signaling, and they harnessed it in a way that actually led to the greater good yeah. being kind of maximized. On the other hand, you can get runaway virtue signaling that goes terribly, terribly wrong, like the Salem witch hunts, right? Like, I'm more virtuous because I will call out the witches in the community. Or the Maoist cultural revolution, where the young people are competing to be purer than each other in terms of their allegiance to communist doctrine, or a lot of the excesses of social justice warriors or Antifa, Mm -hmm. or a lot of the excesses in the 80s of the moral majority and the religious right. So I think virtue signaling is like um, nuclear power. You know, it's a very, very strong passion and instinct that can be used uh, for tremendous good, but I think it's also very, very dangerous in the wrong hands. Yeah. I think that when it comes to the movement that I know best, which is sort of animal rights, it is harder to leverage virtue signaling because people often eat privately. So, Mm -hmm. I don't know, some large minority or even a majority of people who say they're vegetarians have eaten meat, you know, in the last week. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's it's pretty hard to monitor. And in order to signal it, it's, you know, if you can't obviously eat your meals with everybody else. And you also see that in other kinds of movements where people are obviously more focused on doing the thing that's social than they are interested in doing what matters. So one anecdote that I've heard is that if you hire somebody to put solar panels on your house, there's obviously where the solar panels are best placed in order to catch the sun. And then sometimes that's different from where the solar solar panels can be seen from the street. Mm -hmm. And apparently there are solar panel installers who have said people prefer to have the solar panels installed where they can be seen as opposed to where they're actually most effective at catching the sun. Yeah. So... uh, with new technologies and new ways of kind of monitoring each other's behavior, you get new opportunities to either make virtue signals a lot cheaper and easier to fake, mm-hmm. or sometimes make them a lot harder to fake. Yeah. Um, and I think the challenge for any particular social movement or, or political cause is, in some ways, like you want to make a low barrier to entry, you want to make it easy for people to kind of join the cause without a lot of cost so that they can kind of start their newbie virtue signaling in kind of an easy way that's relatively painless. But then you want to provide a ladder of increasingly costly, reliable virtue signals. So in the effective altruism movement, for example, that we're involved in, 
you can take the giving what you can pledge that says, I will give 10% of my income this year and every year mm -hmm. to some effective altruism cause. And then you can kind of talk about that. In one way, it's kind of cheap because you could lie about it. Yes. You could say, I've taken the giving what you can pledge, yeah. and I, I don't actually do it. But most people are pretty uneasy about doing about lying about that, unless they're straight up sociopaths. Um, and in another way, it's it's a very costly signal if you actually do it, because yeah. that's even above the level of tithing expected by the Mormon Church. Yeah, and and religious groups have a certain discomfort with loudly advertising that you tithe or how much money you give mm -hmm. to the church because they want the signal to be not as socially advantageous as it is yeah. honest, right? And obviously, we are doing a very costly and honest signal for our audience because we're sitting here in this desert valley I know. doing a talk about virtue the signaling. The sun is beating down It is on incredibly our warm here. Scorpions yeah. are attacking us. It's, it's really uncomfortable, and you only have half a glass of that, <laughs> that iced tea left. How does virtue signaling relate to uh, virtue ethics and moral philosophy? So these, the, these different branches of moral philosophy that have a different view, like both descriptively and prescriptively about what ethics is and how it works. So you've got your deontology, like Immanuel Kant, that says certain things are just right or wrong intrinsically and you have to obey those moral rules regardless of the cost, right? For example, you catch some terrorist and they know where there's a ticking bomb. Well, a typical deontologist would say you can't pressure them, you can't torture them, even if it would save 10 million lives. Yeah. Right. And then there's utilitarians who say the greatest happiness for the greatest number, you have to calculate costs and benefits. And the right answer in ethical dilemmas is whatever brings the most benefit to people and other sentient beings like animals. So they, they might be willing to torture the terrorist. Yeah. The third stream is virtue ethics, where it's about not how do you judge particular moral dilemmas that are like one shot decisions but rather what virtues and traits and values do you cultivate in your life over time in terms of how you actually interact with the people close to you, your friends, your mates, your family, and the broader society. So virtue ethics is more focused on the content of character hmm. and not just um, short-term decision-making. So you talk a lot about kind of how virtue signaling, obviously we know that signaling evolved in non-human animals. We talked about honest signaling. We talked about costly signaling, about how costly signaling is more likely to be honest. But how did virtue signaling evolve? And here you can talk about kind of the social reasons why, but also sexual, which overlaps quite a lot. Yeah, so I think the mating context is particularly fun and, and important to look at here because when prehistoric people were choosing their sexual partners. They're trying to figure out um, not just who is sexy, but evolution cares a lot about, are you going to be a good partner in the long term? Are you going to be a good parent to potential offspring? Because there's no point in having a bunch of sex in prehistory if you don't have babies. Yep. Evolution cares about the babies. So what you want to do is see how does this person respond when they're irritated, hungry, under stress? Are they going to be a reliable, caring partner? Do they have a propensity to take care of cute, young, vulnerable things, whether they're small humans like kids or little animals or even symbolic figures? So you want to pay attention to their kind of empathy as a virtue and assess it and even actively test it. There's also in courtship some kind of eliciting of parental cues you know people mm -hmm. make fun of baby talk a lot but obviously people play off each mm -hmm. other in a kind of parental and childlike role in relationships and you see this in dolphins as well like dolphins mm -hmm. will be engaging in courtship and one swims like a mother and the other one will swim alongside like a calf so there is some mm -hmm. kind of play along those lines that also happens which is i think testing about parental virtue you could call it right yeah and the virtues don't all have to be these classical Aristotelian virtues that, that are um, put up on a pedestal. Like playfulness can be a virtue. Um, it's a really important virtue if you're raising kids together. And um, 
What's another virtue? Just reliability and predictability. This is very important to you, apparently. Is, is someone saying, I will do X, and then they do X, and you can count on that. Or also even just consistency. So is somebody mm-hmm. similar day to day, or do they differ wildly in their moods for no kind of contextual reason? Yeah. And that's very important. It's very important to be able to predict somebody's behavior if yeah. you're relying on them. And I, yeah, as I, I think that women actually do this more than they necessarily uh, need to in the kind of modern environment. And then, of course, I think an auxiliary benefit of virtue signaling in, in courtship is you can weed out the psychopaths. Mm. You can weed out the people who don't give a shit about others, who don't have empathy, because psychopaths are terrible at sustaining long-term relationships. Um, they might be very, very good on the first date, but their weaknesses in empathy and perspective taking quickly become apparent in relationships. Yep, yeah, they're they're very compelling at first and then if you mm-hmm. are yield to them too quickly then then that's the the kind of problem that you might have. One thing that is interesting that I heard about from somebody in anthropologist studies hunter gatherers is that some western evolutionary psychologists have been very interested in how attractive people find each other's faces and bodies and there are certain groups of people where you say, you know, who has the most attractive face? point out the most attractive body and they'll say mm-hmm. what does it matter if she's not if she doesn't love children or if she's not patient with children yeah. or if she's not loyal or if she doesn't exhibit fidelity or whatever the case may be and so i do think that that's kind of an interesting thing where mm-hmm. in the west we might prioritize attractiveness more than people who actually live in smaller scale societies where they might necessarily need to prioritize the virtue of being a good mate more than that yeah i think that's really interesting that we can kind of separate um facial or bodily attractiveness from moral virtue in a, in a modern consumerist entertainment society, right? You yeah. can go, that, that actor or actress is really hot, they have a shitty personality, but they're still really hot. Yeah. Whereas I think a lot of hunter-gatherers would, would kind of go, I, I can't see them as hot if I know they're a bad person. Mm-hmm. And Those I think that's actually a more natural way to think about people is to have your kind of moral take on their character really profoundly influence how you see them in terms of like even literal attractiveness yeah i i know that yeah i saw your your was it victorian moral virtues victorian mate choice victorian mate choice and yeah you were saying that these there's these questions that people no longer ask these things are considered gauche but in fact we could learn some things about mate choice from how mate choice was performed you know historically not even that long ago right yeah okay so how does virtue signaling relate to debates over free speech and, and hate speech? We've talked to the, about this a bit. You've talked about this in, in a couple of the essays, or three, actually, mm-hmm. of the essays in the book. You talk about how it relates to free speech. Yeah, basically the last half of the book is all about, how. okay, so we have these instincts for virtue signaling. Everybody does it. But how does it play out in modern society in terms of debates over free speech, viewpoint diversity, should we censor certain kinds of hate speech? Should people be canceled or socially stigmatized or ostracized for expressing certain kinds of viewpoints? And I think if you don't understand virtue signaling, it's very hard to make sense of a lot of these debates. So often you get calls for censoring hate speech, whatever that means, by people who like aren't necessarily really that concerned that the hate speech will suddenly take over all of society or result in um, you know, mass slaughter or whatever. Rather, they just feel, feel a visceral moral repulsion against a certain view, and they feel like, I have to say something about it, right? I have to punish it somehow. It's almost like they're back in the hunter-gatherer society, and somebody says something, they're disgusted by it, they want to punish them. Yeah. And then you scale that up to social media, and you get cancel culture and hate speech censorship and all that. Yeah, so I think when people are trying to rationalize wanting to censor somebody in particular, they'll say this person is eliciting aggressive behavior in other people or they're causing people Mm -hmm. to become racist or sexist. So these are the kinds of things that people say. And as we know, because social science isn't really very scientific in many ways, we actually don't know to, to what degree 
these people are actually influential and what kind of harm they're causing. So if you kind of level the criticism at somebody, you're virtue signaling, you're trying to cancel this person, you're, you're engineering a pile on of this person, they'll say, no, 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 it's really important that X person, I won't name anybody in particular because yeah. the example will be called out, but X person is in some way censored or they can't speak to people because they have a huge impact on men or young men or potential terrorists or whatever the case may be when we actually don't we don't know for sure and it's it's unclear really how much influence many of these people have that are called to be sort of canceled yeah i think this is overlap between signaling your moral virtue and signaling your moral disgust at something you don't agree with yeah and the weird thing in social media particularly twitter is the kind of sort of sick fetishistic delight that people take in finding something that they can signal about like oh my god this is a really outrageous comment i'm going to retweet it with comment disavowing it yeah or mocking it or trying to get other people to pile on to the original tweet and yeah. sort of cancel it and i think if you don't understand the social dynamics of virtue signaling and also how moral disgust works it's really hard to to um, recognize what's going on or to fight it or to avoid suffering at the hands but of even even that. obviously people who understand that like you know i've been guilty of doing virtue signaling things on twitter you have been i think sarah Hader did a really good tweet a few months back that i retweeted it basically with with guidelines i think anytime somebody's screenshotting somebody mm -hmm. obviously they're trying to do something to that extent <clears throat> because they're calling somebody out in a way that that person won't necessarily be happy with. Obviously, there are people who just don't like to be called out, even if they have done something wrong. So there's just competitive virtue signaling on, on both aspects. And some of it's honest, but Twitter, almost by definition, it's not gonna be honest because it's very cheap to send a tweet or to start a dog pile. Okay, so how does virtue signaling relate to neurodiversity and cultural diversity? Also two essays that you included that were originally were featured in uh, Quillette. Yeah, so those two essays were really trying to understand how can you under, how can people kind of outside mainstream culture understand the virtue signaling games that people are playing within mainstream culture? Because if you don't understand that, it's very easy to get in trouble. Yeah, For example, yeah. um, there's a lot of neurodiversity in terms of how well people understand other people. You have the the so-called autism spectrum. There's there's Aspies, people with Asperger's syndrome, who find it difficult to do that kind of perspective taking. And I have a touch of that, as you know. And it can make it very difficult because if everybody expects, everybody else has mastered the language of virtue signaling within our culture or within our subculture, and then you violate the social norms, you know, if you assume everybody understands the norms, and can kind of understand human communication, then if somebody violates the norms, you can go, you're a bad person, you're morally disgusting, you deserve to be punished, ostracized, canceled. But in fact, a lot of people with these um, neurodivergent conditions literally can't understand the kind of cultural games that are happening, the virtue signaling games. Likewise, uh, the cultural diversity case. I focus particularly on foreign students coming to American campuses. Like if you grew up in China and you have the great good fortune to be able to go to Harvard or wherever in America because your parents worked hard and they're spending the money and you arrive into Harvard's virtue signaling culture, how the heck are you supposed to master the nuances of that in a way that don't get you into trouble? I think if you don't have these sort of virtue signaling lenses for understanding the moral culture that people face, then it's very easy to judge them harshly. And it's also very easy to ignore the challenges that they face and not to be welcoming and not to actually embrace the, the true diversity of, of people in American culture. Do you want to get to how do companies like Google virtue signal? So we, we I mean, definitely there has been some talk about woke capital, about how various different companies and corporations do <clears throat> consider 
how they will look to shareholders. The Gillette ad was obviously widely touted as being um, interested in virtue signaling. Uh, what happened with James Damore was considered an example of a company virtue signaling. Yeah. Companies do signaling all the time. And they, they do it to potential customers, consumers, but also to investors, to government regulators, to everybody in their supply chain, everybody in their distribution network. Companies have to signal you know, we're a quality company that makes quality products, but also recently they've gotten into straight up virtue signaling to say these are our political beliefs as a company. Yeah. Often that's been green consumerism, companies saying we care about the environment and global warming and pollution and we're going to do something about that. Yeah. Sometimes it's reaching, reaching out to particular sexual subcultures, like we are the car company that's friendly to gay and lesbian people, Subaru, for example. Um, but recently, it seems like every company wants to get on the woke capitalism virtue signaling bandwagon of particularly champion, championing progressive leftist causes. And I think often that's because the people in the companies who work in public relations and marketing are themselves progressive leftists to a much greater degree than the consumers are mm -hmm. or the investors are. So you can get this mismatch within a company between what's actually in the interests of the shareholders versus what's in the kind of personal virtue signaling interests of particular employees. And I think it, it, it's really hard to understand modern consumerist capitalism if you don't have this understanding of signaling by companies. Yeah, especially, I think you might have already said marketers, but marketers are much yeah. leftier than consumers right. on right. average, right? Yeah. So why should people buy your book, Jeffrey Miller? People should buy them the book because it gives them a whole new set of insights into daily life, into human interaction, into the kinds of signaling that we all do instinctively to each other kind of all the time, but often unconsciously. And it's hard to see it because there are good reasons why we should be kind of deceived, self-deceived about the signaling that we do. It's hard to do good signaling if you're conscious of it. You, you just have to do it kind of instinctively and that works best. Um, but when it gets to the kind of political realm, the religious realm, I think it's really hard to have constructive public discussions if people aren't more self-aware about this. I think it's also hard to have good relationships, sexual relationships, family relationships, interactions with your extended family over a Thanksgiving dinner if you're not tuned into how virtue signaling works. You can get into a lot of pointless arguments. Yeah. You know, if you're on a first date and somebody differs from you about some particular political issue and you write them off as being not worth your time, well, that's often pretty stupid because, number one, their view might not be that deeply entrenched. It might be open to change. Number two, it might not actually matter that much in the ongoing relationship. Um, like my parents don't agree on a lot of political, political issues, but they understood very early on that you can have a very happy, successful marriage and raise kids together and have a, a good family without having to agree about everything. The other reason people should buy the book is it's pretty cheap, uh -huh. it's short, it's fun to read. It's very accessible. You don't need to understand science, economics, signaling theory to get through it. And I think it's really um, politically relevant in this moment, especially in the run-up to the 2020 election. Yeah. So I think it can, it can save people a lot of um, tension and heartbreak and, and difficulty, particularly in social media, but also just in these, these personal discussions with friends and family. If they kind of get this new point of view that that lets them understand their own signaling behavior better and also cuts other people a bit more slack for their signaling behavior. Yeah, I think especially with social media that virtue signaling has become even more important because there are far more ways now to signal your virtues and it's actually more difficult if you don't know people in person in order to evaluate whether those virtues actually exist. Yeah, and people tend to take these isolated little comments like individual tweets or individual Facebook posts or mm 
offhanded comments in an interview and kind of blow them up into an attribution of, oh, that person is evil yeah. globally in a stable way that predicts their behavior in every domain just because on this one little issue they happen to disagree with me. Yeah. So I think if you have this perspective that virtue signaling is, um, you know, it's often unreliable when we make those inferences from little isolated pieces of behavior to inferring about somebody's global virtues or vices. And we just have to be kind of epistemically humble. And yeah. go, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're they're a really nice, great, empathic person. Probably most people are other than the psychopaths. So let's let's cut each other quite a bit of slack. Great. Thanks. So virtue signaling is available. Where is it available? It's available on Gumroad and we will post the link below. And yeah, down there. <laughs> and uh, um, the, the Gumroad description includes a little more detail about it. And, um, you know, eventually I might release it as well on, on Amazon in, in a kind of traditional Kindle format. Okay. We'll, we'll see. How, how much goes. is it, Jeffrey? It's uh, $7.49. And it's about like 30,000 words. It's about 80 to 120 pages, depending yeah. on how your, your e reader works. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.